Hi everybody, here we are again, back in the Woodwork and Wisdom workshops. Uh, my name's Colin Way. Now, um, I do apologise, not being here Tuesday. We've mixed it up a little bit this week for you, and today is going to be the turning session. Now, over the last, I think, four sessions that we've had together, we've looked at multi-piece turnings, and today we're going to end that. We're just going to give you a few more ideas, and I'm not actually... This is, even though we've shown this soldier that stood in front of me here... This is more a technique-based demonstration for you rather than a project. To do a project of this sort of size, this sort of scale, like you've seen with the spaceships that we've been doing in the previous weeks, um, it takes a lot of time. What um, I want to get across is to you is how we build something like this. With a, with a spaceship, with a hard item, a hard object like a, a rocket, you've got quite a lot of um, uh, license to, to change or freedom of, of um, expression in, in terms of the build, you can do pretty much whatever shape you want. If you're copying something like an iconic spaceship, then you've got to be a little bit more, um, uh, you've got to follow a pattern more, I suppose. But when it comes to, to the human body or animals, then you've got to be a little bit more precise again with what you do. You've got to look at uh, uh, dimensions so a hand to wrist, wrist to elbow, elbow to shoulder, all those sorts of things um, uh, have to be quite important. There's several bits of information that you need to take away when you, or start looking at when you start building a, a realistic figure. And I like doing sort of this sort of thing. When I say realistic figures, I mean animals and I mean um, sort of the human body, that sort of stuff. But you could, of course, go right the way back into sci-fi and go for aliens you can go for dragons you can do whatever you want whatever um sort of takes your fancy you can do um now this figure here this is the inspiration from this one is that, that spartan warrior so that spartan warrior pose um he's an unfinished figure he's rather cold at the moment because he's, he's rather naked as well um but there's lots of things to add to this a plume he'd want a cape he'd want his um for better words skirt uh, shin protectors all those things that we can add those little bits of detail the body itself is very much just a carrier for all those bits of detail. So, yes, it's got to look human-like, and there are a few features in it which we're going to go over in a minute, like the, the calf muscles. He's got a good six-pack going on. He's got a couple of good glutes there as well. But things that make him a human person, um, uh, we need to show, okay? Um, the inspiration, well, not the inspiration, but the the the, the journey starts with this sort of thing. And these you can buy. These are um, an artist's figures that you can pose, you can put in dependable positions. These are really, really good. They're cheap as well. Um, I've seen them recently for about £10, but you can get them you know, in all shapes and sizes um, and all genders as well, actually. Um, but these are good for scaling. So these give you an idea of what I was just talking about. Um, fingers to wrist, wrist to elbow, and all that sort of stuff. So I use this quite a lot for scaling. You want to get dimensions, so a width of a head. How wide is a head compared to it? And and you know you can you can slightly alter it to to give him more muscular arms or her more muscular arms, um, bigger waist, those sorts of things. But that's that's in the workshop all the time. I really find them quite useful. Um, the other inspiration, of course, or forms of um, of help when building these is is the internet and i've just taken off just got one spartan soldier there i put spartan soldier in and that's what come up maybe we can see that a little bit better on camera too there so um just a, a picture of a soldier so that's given me ideas for shields and things like that now we from that i've come up with um my own shield and we'll talk about, if you notice there, we've got some metal effects on here. We're going to talk a lot more about metal effects. There's some exciting new things happening with us next couple of weeks. And next week especially is going to be looking at metal effects and um, uh, 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 other embellishing um, materials. But that's what I'm trying to get at is this, the internet is another great source. We're just going to take a question. I want to do one and um, talk about one other uh, source of inspiration as well or um, not so much inspiration, but help when um, creating a form like this. Yes, and we got Craig on the cameras and the questions as well, by the way. So, Craig, yes, what's the first Thank question? You. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to have you with us. We've got a couple of early questions, my friend, please. Um, so, Colin, your disc sander on the lathe, 
How big is the disc? Do you use hook and loop or adhesive discs? And what grade of sandpaper do you generally use? It sounds like I've paid you to do this because this is all about those things. Now, let me just move this figure a minute. We're going to bring them back. We'll just move that figure. Um, so I've put on this video today, I've put the links to all of the things that you're after. I've even put some choices there for you. So to start with, let's just look at the disc. So basically the bit the disc is a plywood disc it's on what we refer to as a faceplate ring that faceplate ring then fits on the c jaws of our chuck okay so it's a really easy thing to do now in terms of the disc itself i have in this case it's a 120 grit abrasive okay links are all below the video um, and in this case again sorry this one's an 80 but I'm using 120 and the 80. In fact, I've ordered today from Axminster um, my uh, another two replacements of the same grits, 80 and 120. 120 will do most of your work. 80 is your is your um, is your bully. It takes off all the the um, uh, you know the the excess bolt quickly. But the 120 is where you want to be for finishing. So that's that one. Now these are from memory 230 millimeters wide. Okay. Now, we sell them, the links are all below the video, we sell them as, um, I think they're under the jet heading, um, but hook and loop back. Also below this video, I've given you a link to two options when it comes to the hook itself. The strip, which you can buy in one meter long, uh, long length by 100 mil wide, I've given you that link below. I've also given you the link to the disc, um, so you can buy a 230 mil disc and put that on. So the um, hook, but with an adhesive backing on. So you've got all that below. And then as we get into it, I'll show you more in terms of the platform. This is, again, it's all below this video. You'll see the um, the tool post, the, um, what is actually a carving plate here, um, but we've utilized it to, to create this, this sanding platform. Uh, one thing I haven't put on there, maybe um, Craig or Axminster can have a look and just see if I've got the stop collar on there. If not, yeah, that's easy to find. Again, it has to be the right one for the collar that you're using. And just a, a word of note there, I've put the, um, the one-inch uh, uh, tool post on the links below. When you open the page, just make sure it's the right tool post for your lathe. So there's 25 mil, an inch, um, I think it's a, a three quarter and I think a five eight as well. So make sure it's the right one for your lathe. But then the, the stock collars are all available and they all fit the carving uh, carving top. So all that information is there for you. Right. Yes, great. Yeah, I've got another question um, from David. Um, can he use a diamond card to sharpen a three millimeter diamond shaped parting tool? Um, if, if you Yes, you can, um, because the actual business part of the diamond parting tool is flat. Um, so it's only the side profiles that, that that diamond shape. So yeah, absolutely no problem. Um, I would, a little bit like a skew, do most of your sharpenings with a diamond file, but every now and again, probably five or six um, sharpens out of, uh, one sharpen out of five or six, then go with your mechanical sharpening system, whether that's a Tormet, whether it's a, um, um, a CBN, Carborundum, Linisher type. Once every now and again, just do that with, that, with a mechanical version. All right. One more, yeah. One more before you get cracking from Frederick. Good afternoon, Frederick. Um, how did you finish your robots? He has uh, he's found using reactive paints. All uh, finish tended to make the effect disappear. Wow. Really, really glad you, you've asked that because next week and the week after, I'm going to introduce you to a range of reactive paints. We're going to play around with exactly that, whether it's copper effect, copper rust, real rust, um, uh, bronzing, uh, the verdigris on bronzing, all those sorts of things. We're going to look at doing that. Um, there's a few techniques, and it's going to take more than one um, uh, one video to show you this. Um, so we're going to do it over the next few weeks now. And we've got some guests coming along to, to do some videos for us, to do some streams for us. Um, we may be visiting some other workshops for, for that as well. So we are going to show you. Can I, would you mind, we leave it one more week um, before I get everything out, because I need it's a it's a big old subject and it's going to eat up today. But um, um, it, I suspect I suspect you're putting the reactive or the reactor on um, at the wrong state. Reactive paints like to be wet when they're um, when they're given the reactor 
Um, so that's probably a reason. Might you might be letting it dry too too long or or that sort of thing, and maybe some sort of consistency issue. But uh, uh, if you can give me the question via email and tell me everything you've done, I can then talk and and look at it um, uh, on the stream. Okay. All right for the moment. Okay, so one more thing. So I was talking then about where you get your inspirations, uh, where you get your source of of information, that sort of thing. So look, this this pose I had in my head. I even had Ben next door in that pose so I could keep an eye on uh, the angles that I was making everything to to make sure that was right because I couldn't find a picture of that exact pose on the web. I could find the actual soldiers, I couldn't find their the way they were dressed, that sort of thing. What is useful, though, and I'm going to really, I don't know, I have no commission or anything from this, but here's a book. I'm just going to get our soldier out of the way. And this book I find really useful for most um, sort of lifelike turnings that I do. This is um, Bern Holgarth. It's a dynamic drawing range. This is one book in a series. So this is the... the um, uh, like I say, it's dynamic drawing uh, series. This one is sort of like the whole body. Now, I don't know whether we can go above there, Craig, with that show off a little bit more. But basically what it does, it gives me an anatomy and it gives me the muscles broken down. It's a drawing book at the end of the day, but it's fantastic for going over those biceps, those triceps, those those quads, any bits of detail that you need. And to be honest, you can find... Um, in the turning world, what we do as, a, as wood turners, um, the body is made up of lots of circular bits. Um, where it isn't, for instance, I'm not going to do any flexing for you here, but where it isn't, um, then we've got sanding discs, we've got um, little drum sanders, all those sorts of things to sand away the bits to create the shapes. And if I can show you one bit on here, and I know this is a lot of talking, but it's quite important to get across. I'm just going to show you a particular piece um, that demonstrates that. Now, which camera's best? Ah, oh, perfect. So this is a great demonstration here. So we've got the calf muscles here. So the calf muscle has to be turned, has the widest um, diameter. So I'm going to turn one of these in a minute just to show you. And then you sand in the detail, the little, the separation of the muscle tissue. You can see on this one here that you've got the rise coming over the back and then the, the back of the shin here. Okay, even little dynamic sections like this foot bending, that's just turned as one section, flattened off, and then cut and rejoined. You've seen me do that plenty of times on arms for nutcrackers, for smokers, that sort of stuff. But it's an easy, that's an easy one to do. So basically it would have been this um, shape made, cut, sanded to an angle, then glued back together. Another thing I want to show you today as well is things like the knees. So where we would end uh, a certain um, uh, shape, um, we've got to think about how it's going to glue together. You can see the glue line there, but what we've got is the knee. So after the angles have been um, cut, sanded, and glued, then we can start shaping. So we're going to round over the end of this bit of turning. But you can see the sort of shape of the thigh there. You can see we've got a nice round coming over to that little concave. Now, if you need to take any away, you're always going to find that the muscle's going to drop lower on the bottom, so you can flatten off the top a little bit, for instance. So it's the study of the things like the, the, the anatomy in um, Hogarth's book, for instance, or just um, on the web, or just pictures in general, or just studying, studying you know, form. If you're doing um, true fantasy figures like dragons and, and aliens and stuff like that, you have, like I say, you do have a little bit more freedom, but you still got the, the, the rules of um, you know, the anatomy to, to play by. Yes, Craig, another question. Well, not questions. Well, it is actually a question from Maria in Wales. Um, can we have a photo of Ben in that pose, please? Just before we went live, I said to Craig, I said, oh, I've got that photo of Ben we're going to put there. And um, I got rid of it in the week. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, well, it's a shame. It would have been good. Yeah, it I'd enjoy that. <laughs> I'm not sure Ben would have, but never mind. Um, and Paul Otters asked, did you make Ben dress up when he posed for you? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. He wasn't dressed up. Um, he was dressed, but he wasn't dressed up. Um, no. Um, he was literally just, I asked him to get in a pose, manipulated his arms around a little bit, and said, right, freeze. And, uh, and that was it. So he's doing a little bit of uh, life modeling for us. <laughs> he won't do it ever again now, I know. Okay, well, let's just get a few things out of the way and let's start a bit of turning. We're not going to go through the whole process. We're not going to go make that today. It takes too long. That's that's 
probably about a day's worth of turning there for me to do in, prior to this stream. So I want to show you the, the how-tos as opposed to the whole project. So to start with, and if, you know, you could go and create a really, really detailed figure. That's entirely up to you. You, you need to study each part of the anatomy um, and then go away and work out how you're going to do it. Now, there's a, as many pieces in the bin as finished pieces here because to understand to get the shape just right before you sand parts away takes a little, quite a lot of thought process there's a, a fantastic wood turner out there Derek Weidman if you su uh, search him um, on the web um, have a look at uh, his creations far better than anything I'm doing here but what he's doing is is multi-access turning rather than multi-piece turnings but he's um, his eye is what he can see in in three dimensions on the lathe is quite incredible derek weidman have a look for him He's nice uh, really really good young american turner um but incredible pieces of work buffalo heads rhino heads elephant heads all those sorts of things really really interesting but you have to think in 3d you have to think in almost 4d really because you're taking stuff away what you you know what what we turn 50 percent of it is going to be uh, missing by the time we finish let's turn a shin oh sorry a lower leg then we'll turn at the, the top of the leg and we'll look at how we can join those together. So we're starting with blanks of timber. I've got several um, offcuts here. We're just going to start with these. Um, I will turn today. We're going to do the shin. We're going to do um, the thigh. We'll do we'll do a stomach. We'll put a six pack in. Um, and let's do, we're going to look at spear tip because that's quite an interesting one. Um, with the, uh, the festive period, I won't say the, the word, the festive period coming up. Um, the spear tips, uh, the stars, you know, all those sorts of things, Christmas trees. I said it. Sorry, Craig. Um, you, you're going to need to know how to turn the form before sanding, um, what it's going to look like after sanding, those sorts of things. So we'll have a look at that uh, also. So to start with, Braddle, we're going to use two ring centers. So I've got a friction drive ring center and I've got a tailstock ring center. Okay. These are really quite wide. They're really, really good for this sort of thing. If you know, the inevitable happens. You get a catch, for instance. The timber will stop moving between those two centers rather than the catch being driven in too deep. So this is going to be the lower part of the leg. Now, it seems or it looks as though it's quite a chunky, thick piece. Don't forget what I said earlier, though. You know, we have to turn the widest area um, and then sand that away. So it's actually going to be a lot thinner when finished, purely because of that um, removing that excess wood. So... And I'm going to do it quite aggressively on the sander. So normally I'd take a little bit of time over it, but I want to get this done quickly for you. So it's a shin shape. Looks nothing like a shin when we first finish, when we first um, turn it. Okay, so lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. And I'm going to get this going fairly quickly. Let me just raise that tool rest a wee bit. So 2000 plus. There we are. Let's just quickly, um, we'll skim that one down. So the diameter of this is about 30 mil. Okay, we we're going to, it's going to be a lot smaller in a minute. So down to cylinder first. Just a little finishing cut when we're down to that cylinder. So what we'll have is, let's have the high spot of our shin and calf about there okay so now let's go with a spindle gouge i'm going to do a little og on this side now don't forget the knee's going to be up here so And I need to make sure I've got enough waist to take away because there's going to be a hole and a little ring left at this side as well. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, what do I need? Yeah, so that's okay there. So that's not too bad. I'm looking at the figure I've already made. I'm not going to go and find it in my book, but out uh, there. Now, the underside is very different. The, the If you look at a calf muscle, 
the bottom of that calf comes around quite sharply, especially if, it, if it's a defined muscle. Um, so we want to bring that, that, that shape over. So let's just take a little bit of waist out the bottom. There we are. So the, the actual shin is going to be quite thin. And then again, we'll round over. It's actually going to go quite flat into the ankle. So in fact, I'm not going to round over that much. Just soften the edge. And now we can form the calf. So that's what I mean about sharp. Then you can draw out the shin. Now, this is what I mean. At the moment, it looks nothing like the bottom of a leg. But in a minute, we're going to sand that away. Sand or sand the front of it away to make it look more calf-like. There we are. Right, bear with me. Funny looking lower leg, isn't it? But trust me, that will be in a minute our calf the front is all going to be sanded away, so that won't be there. We're just going to leave the back end. I'll carry on. And for your info, the top of the leg is the same length as the bottom. In this case, I'm using 100 mil stock. So we'll go with the same 100 mil on the top, on the thigh. A little bit bigger now, so I'm going to go to a roughing gouge. Same speed. I'm happy with the speed. We're not we're still not pushing um, big pieces around. This is nice and small. This is about 50 mil now, so two inch. And I'm going to go with the roughing gouge to start us off. Just one thing while I'm thinking about it, Frederick. If you um, if you know the name of the um, reactive paints you were, you were using in your email, can you just put the name down so I know what we're looking at? Well, oh, that's a little bit big. Let's just take that down in size a bit. Normally, I'd have the calipers out. We'd measure everything. I'd go to my little mannequin. Um, and times up or times down or the divide sorry depending on the size that i wanted so um in my figure i was 1.5 one and a half times um, bigger than the mannequin so i just upscaled by 1.5 um you don't have to you can say whatever size you want really but look, i'm just judging this by eye at the moment so thigh shape so we're gonna so taper down to the knee Big chunky thighs. Our uh, our Spartan Mori has obviously been in training for a long time. He needs his his legs to be strong, so he's got big thigh muscles. Don't worry too much. We we don't have to worry too much about the fixings, the actual holding points on the lathe, because most of those will be taken away. If you look at what I've got going on here, let me just take our friend's sword off of him, turn the lathe off. If you see what we've got going on here, you know, where the lathe would have um, driven this piece of turning, this bit here, it's hidden, it's sanded flat. It's going into uh, what is the glutes back here. Um, the same on this side. It's it's you know it's not there. It's not seen. This is actually um, a concave um, sand on there, and I've done that with one of our little drum sanders. Okay, so you know you don't have to worry quite as much as a piece of timber that's or piece of turning that's 
um, that's going to be exposed. This generally isn't exposed, so you can get away with a lot more. So let's tidy some of this up now. So when it comes to a thigh, they're not so they're not so defined. I don't have to worry about things like the calf. I can be a little bit softer with the, the muscle. So just bring them over. Like I say, most of this will be sanded away anyway. I'm not too worried. We're going to round over the knee. This is important. Because there will be a part of this area here, which will be the kneecap. And so we want that to blend over nicely. Okay. I'm going to do that now. So we're going to create the join. Create the join um, and then show you how these are glued together really you know one of my favorite glues is the um, z poxy um, and z poxy five minute in this case because I'm, rather than glue it all together at the end what i'm what i'm doing is i'm building these i find it really quite important that we do one section at a time make sure it looks right um, and get the angles right lay it out on the table then glue those bits together before you move on to the next otherwise you might find that you've done a lot of hard work you've got all the pieces and when you put it together something looks out of balance so it's quite important to start building it get the legs right first make sure they're they're right get them connected to the hips make sure all that's right then the six pack get that right then the chest and so on so you keep scale all the way um, i find that really useful so five minutes I'm not mixing big loads of uh, glue up. It's dry quite quickly, almost to the point where you mix it up, glue it together and hold it there until it dries. Then you can move on. Um, so I find that really, really useful. Zepoxy, again, look at the links below um, this stream. You'll see that uh, that link there. About five minutes. There's, these are really big tubes in here. So you get two of those. Two of those. I'm chasing Craig. He's chasing me. Uh, two, two of those. So it's quite big um, tubes. Now that for me, they last me well over a year um, on those. One thing I will say is uh, the shelf life. Once you start going beyond that, um, then you can run into problems. They may start to crystallize. So use it. Um, also, don't let it get too cold. In the winter, you'll find if it's left in the workshop and we get very cold. Um, temperatures then you'll find it hardens up and it takes forever to get it out the, the bottle so either keep it in house or in uh, somewhere warmer um, the summer is lovely because it just runs out quite easily you know but it's like any epoxy it, uh, it's a 50 well not like any epoxy it's a 50 50 mix um, but not like a casting um, epoxy where you have to be overly precise about 50 50 is right okay that works Okay, so let's put our sanding disc on. We are going to get some dust extraction going as well in a minute. And whilst I'm doing this, this is a good moment just to remind you, anybody, if you're watching this live, just to remind you that we've got an event coming up where me and, Ms., me and Jason are going to be attending and exhibiting, but there's 14 um, demonstrators or exhibitors there, um, and Wizardry and Wood in London, Frogmore Avenue, um, centre of London, starting on the 13th wednesday the 13th right up to the following saturday um some great turners there and also some good demonstrations if you're around or can get to london um between those dates come and say hello pay us a visit yes great another question just on wizardry cliff said earlier he's already got his ticket oh well we'll see you there then cliff make sure you, you make yourself known to us like i say both me and jason side by side i might add um at the event so come and say hello and have a cup of tea uh, right then, so I'm going to put my sanding disc on there now. Um, there it is. C jaws. Okay, this is the SK114. You've got the C jaws here. And it's quite simple. The, the outside of the C jaws are a, a dovetail. And the inside of our faceplate ring is a dovetail. And they match. And so you just literally put it on, expand. Don't forget your speeds. I've just turned off at over 2,000 revs. I don't want to be starting off at that speed. So lay speed to zero before you turn the lathe on. Okay. Yes, Greg. Uh, what timber are you using? And are there timbers that kind of lend themselves better for this sort of modeling project? Yeah, there are really. So um, at the moment I've got a uh, tulip. So it's, there's a grain 
but it's very much like lime. Um, the surface is smooth. So if I said to you, ash and oak, they're, they're coarse, they're heavily grained. So if you um, have ever seen anything that's been limed, generally it'd be ash or oak or any of those grains that have got an open porous um, grain structure. Um, tulip doesn't have that. Lime doesn't have that. Sycamore's another good one. Maple's another good one. Those sorts of things. So when if you decide to paint, which this figure is painted, then you don't get the um, the grain coming through on the paint. It is like, a, a, you know, just a, a I want to say uh, featureless. The features there when you sand it heavily and, you've, and you can see the the colours coming through, um, but this will be a single surface, not lots of pores there. So I find that best if I'm painting things um, to use that sort of material. Um, you know, you don't want to take your best you, your one of your exotics, your best bur oaks, all those sorts of things, and cover them up with loads and loads of paint. It's just it's criminal almost. Um, you want to take very plain timber and use it um, uh, for, for your modeling projects. Um, what was the other question after that? That was that was it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, tulip in this case. But those timbers that I've mentioned are ideal. Uh, sycamore, um, uh, tulip, um, uh, all of the plainer ones. OK, so there we got our sanding disc on. I had the, the lace speed turned down to zero. And we're going to look at creating that knee. So I'm not going to do any particular um, angle. Also, I want to create the the um, calf muscle as well. So we're going to do that for you. I'm going to do this quickly on this one. But there are other sanding discs that come into play here. So I use this one primarily. But then I'll go to things like the power sanding heads. Got a couple of power sanding heads here. There we are. So you can see the profiles on these. This one's nice and tapered. This one's a little bit more um, square. But again, I use both of those. And we've got different sizes of those, of course, um, if you need something to get into a bit more detail. And like I've mentioned earlier, and again, links are below, um, I've got a box box set of drum sanders, which, again, I'm using all the time. You, you, you know, the, the discs are great for convex curves. You need something for concave curves as well. So those are, are really, really good. Another question there, Craig? Yeah, Robert's just asked if he has missed the second wood turning session for the robot, or is it scheduled soon? Did I not do one? Did I? I, I don't. I can't remember. Oh, no, sorry, the uh, the robot. Okay, yeah, so the smoking man. So what we, we looked at, again, we'd done what we were doing here, really. Um, that was, uh, for instance, this is what we can do. This is how you make some of the parts, the harder parts. However, I've got a two-parter in making um, German smokers or Rauschemann um, coming up in the festive period, I think in November, the festive period has started, as, hasn't it, already? But um, November, I think we're uh, doing... It started for you a month ago, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, Rauschemann, we are doing that. So, yeah, stay tuned for that one. Um, I think it's in November time. But that'll be a two-parter, so um, literally um, one after the other. Okay. Yeah, no, I only done, like I said, I showed some of the more significant parts on the robots. Again, if you get yourself to London, it'll be making an appearance up there as well. You can have a look at it and ask me questions about it there. But we will be doing the smokers, yes. Right, we're going to make a calf on our lower leg here now. So lay speed is zero. I'm going to turn the extraction on. Obviously, we the extractor um, hose is really, really close. It's taking it from source. I don't know, can you see that on another... Yeah, there we are. So there's my extractor. As that comes off, it's going to be hopefully be going up that extractor and not down my lungs. Saying that, saying that, the extractor isn't the only thing that I have protecting me uh, normally. Now, I'm not wearing a, a dust mask today purely because I want you to hear me. I've got a microphone here. In my own workshop, I'm fully protected all of the time. Dust extractor is running. I've got a dust mask. In fact, I've got my visor on, which is air powered. Um, so I'm protecting myself directly from the dust, um, as well as taking majority of it away with the dust extractor. Okay. So let's do our calf muscle. It's quite easy to start with. The front, or this section here is going to be a shin, and this is going to be the calf. So I'm just going to start by sanding a bulk of that top layer away.
Now this is a fairly worn disc, but it's doing the job really, really quickly. Now I'm getting to a point where I've taken most of the front of that muscle away. Okay, now I can start blending in. Don't worry, I will show you this in a moment. And don't worry also about little facets at this stage. Don't forget the front of your shin is pretty flat. Now I'm starting to put some curvature in. Remember, again, the bottom of your calf is rounded. There are no hard edges. At the moment, on this side, I've got a hard edge. Okay? It's not in real life. It's rounded over. So already we're starting to get that shin and calf appearance. Do the same on the other side. There we are. We're about there. A little bit more off of that one. We're about there. Now, again, if you look at pictures of a calf, or if you have a particularly defined calf, you'll have a little separation in the middle. Use the corner of your sanding disc. Or you can carve. It's entirely up to you. Just getting a little bit of separation going on there and then of course it's down to hand sanding if i say it's down to hand sanding what i would do now after we've done the course sanding is blend all those facets away and again done really really quickly with your power sander and what grit have i got on here that's a little bit too fine that's a, a 400 your power sander head let's go to let's go to a 180 And then blend in a few of these little facets. And of course, with a power sander, you can then start going down through the grades. 180, 240, 320, 400. And getting a really fine finish. I like to see, on these figures, I like to see a little bit of facet. So it's not completely smooth. So it looks chipped away almost or, or carved away. There's a really well-known carving um, that I particularly like, and it's a man chiseling himself out of a solid lump of granite, and it's titled his uh, Self-Made Man. And I really like that. I've got uh, a lot of inspiration from that particular carving. And I like that play on words. There we are. Just blend the shin in best to do these obviously two at a time so do your pair of legs so they're they staying the same but there we are look that's coming on there's our the back of our shin and the sorry the front of our shin and the back car doesn't use much imagination to see how that a link in now so let's go back to let's go back to the big disc just to create the knee so roughly 45 degrees in this instance i mean when it comes to our figure here they're going to be different angles to suit the different pose it's still i mean it's close but this is nowhere near 45 degree on this one where that one is more like it but it, it's nice to you know you can make out some of these little facets in this though i quite like that it almost gives the effect of of, of muscle tone But let's go 45. So you've got to think, you can't do a 45 degree anywhere. I mean, I wouldn't want to do a 45 degree, for instance, you know, that way. Otherwise, it'll all be facing the wrong way. It needs to be thought about, and I'm going to have my 45 degrees 
going like this. And it's 45 degrees-ish, remember. You've got to suit your pose. So it's a lot of taking a little, standing a little bit away, going testing it on the bench, stand a little bit away, test it on the bench, and so on. That's enough for the minute. That's enough for the minute. We're now going to get the the thigh in place. I haven't sanded any of this figure away, of course. You know, you will do that. The top of the thigh needs a little bit more, um, a little bit more waste removal. There we are, right. Doesn't take, again, it doesn't take a huge amount of imagination to see how easy that knee now is formed just by joining them back together. Okay, let me just hold it the other way so you can see it. All right. There we are. Okay, so we've got a good knee form there now. You'll now need to make the foot, create the bend in the ankle. And again, that's by cutting and rejoining again. But fairly simple. We're starting to get a calf, um, a fairly decent calf lookalike there. And the thigh is hanging down on the underside, just down from the glute. A little bit flatter on the top here if we're going to make it a little bit more realistic. But we're getting there. Almost one leg done. Okay. So, onwards and upwards from there. Let's look. I'm just going to do the, the stomach, so the six-pack, and then I want to do the spear tip for you. Keep asking questions if you've got any. Um, we do want to look at the hands, but um, I'm just going to describe those for you in a minute as well because they're a fairly easy bit, but also they're quite a quite important bit as well. You, get, you need to decide with a hand whether you're going to be, whether you want to make um, them almost like the foot where you do it in a single piece and bend it, or in this case where I've... <laughs> gone the painstaking um, route of creating um, the actual finger joints knuckles i wanted to i've done it in this case purely because i wanted to have him holding a spear so i needed to have him gripping something um and i just decided it would be easier to do that than try and do it out of a solid um we'll have a look at that in two seconds though let me just do the i'm going to do a spear tip actually rather than the midriff the midriff is will be our go-to if we have time. Spear tip's quite a nice one to do. I'm going to put a different chuck on. We're going to go with our, you know, one of my favourite sets. Okay, so my step jaws. Now, the spears that I've made, or this spear in particular that I've made, Again, I've just followed the, the picture that I got off the web. Um, it had a handle, and it had the actual spear point. In fact, it did have a spike on the bottom. I haven't included that one. Um, I will do. But look, this is all um, drilled out. It's fairly simple. The top is... Have I glued that in? Looks like I've glued that in. But again, there's a hole drilled up through there. And this isn't turned. This is just dowel. I buy lots of dowel in various different sizes. Again, there's links below. 
Um, this particular one here, I think, is about a four mil dowel. This is the one that I've used for the spear. But dowels available in all sizes. And I, like I say, I use an awful lot of it. I've got tons of the stuff down here. Depending on what we need to do, that will depend on the size. This particular dowel is a really good quality one. It's a beach dowel. So it's not a softwood dowel. It, it's really quite strong. And that, incidentally, the fluted version of the six mil dowel is the, the, um, the means to um, hold most of the bigger parts together. So if you're worried about butt jointing not being enough, because I'd butt joint the knee, the, the shin, and the, the thigh together, if you're worried about that not being strong enough, drill both um, mating surfaces and use a bit of dowel. Just join them together with that. A lot of uh, my robots and things are done with, with, uh, with dowel. Okay. So anyway, spear tip, spear tip. We need to drill it first. Once we've drilled, then we can think about creating the actual shape. So let's go. What drill have I got by hand? About a four mil bit. If we've got a four mil bit of dowel, four mil bit would work. So we're going to use keyless chuck. And I just grab my drill bit. Let's say. Because everybody has a drill bit in their pocket. Let's go that one. There we are. Place speed to zero, turn the lathe on. I'm going to go fairly quick on this, about 2,000 revs. It's a small drill bit, but we want to clear the waste quite quickly. So what I mean by that is as you, nice and gentle to start with, really important. As you approach, if you go really quickly, you can get a lot of uh, movement on the drill. But once you've bit and you're, you're actually on the way, then you can speed up a little bit. Again, not too much. Make sure you're clearing the swarf. This is going quite quick. Uh, that's actually deep enough. Don't need to go any deeper. But clear the swarf because these small bits, the minute they, they clog up with shavings, they're going to veer off at an angle. So you need to keep them nice and clean. There we are. Now that's warm, so I'm not going to put that back in my pocket just yet. That can go there. Remove that one. We've got the hole. So now all we need to do is turn the spear or spear tip. Yes, Gray. Yeah, just to comment from uh, Maria and question. Um, when she turned her bender robot, um, she drilled through the legs and the feet, the arms, and kind of put wire through so it had some kind of movement and flexibility. Yeah. Could, could you do that with this sort of thing? You can do that with this sort of thing. Obviously, the, the size or gauge of wire will have to increase as, as your uh, model does as well. The hands are done with wire, and that was one thing I wanted to show you. The wire that I'm using here is this. It's the same wire, actually, that Ben uses for um, his pyrography tips. Um, scientific wire company um, but it's a nickel chrome wire you don't have to go quite as extreme as this but the, I like this because it's really strong it it, it withstands a lot of bending around so uh, you know some wires if you bend them more than twice they'll start snapping this doesn't do that so this is quite good I, I've joined all the fingers have been joined together with this wire um, and it just means that you can you've got a little bit of movement obviously when you glue things as well there's, there's the handle obviously when you glue the wire or glue things onto the wire then you've got a limited movement but he will still bend nicely he'll grip he'll grip onto the the um the spear so no good point maria that uh, that really does work when it comes to our mannequins of course there's springs inside these guys so that's how you can bend them around and put them into a pretty much almost position. But there's little tiny springs um, on each of the limbs. Okay, so we've done our hole. So let's go to the skew. Go with a little skew here, a little 12 mil. Clear the waste. Put it back in the chuck. There we are. It happens to everybody. We're going to wait for all the comments to come in now, Craig. <laughs> I'm expecting. <laughs> I'm going to pop it back in here because it's no... We'll just carry on. I'm off centre now, so let, let's tap it in. Right, 
quite glad do. you hadn't sharpened that to a spear, actually. I might have been a bit more worried with that coming, <laughs> coming towards me there. We have got Craig sat to one side rather than down the firing line, so don't worry. Does that make you feel any better? Not really, no. <laughs> but I'm taking my time a little bit now. We're not rushing quite as much. So the spear tip. Now, let's have a look at the one we've done already. So you can see the shape of that. Okay. So we've got a, a fairly lengthy bit there that carries the hole before we go to the actual tip itself. Um, it's not too badly centered. Now, I must admit, I was... Because obviously we're going to turn close to that hole. I want it to be centered. So we'll do that bit first. Take away a little bit of the wool. go then we can start the actual shape so you're thinking you know bearing in mind we're going to sand this down flat so you're just doing the the outside profile it's almost a case of wince your eyes it's the that outer um silhouette you're looking at you're not at the moment looking at you know looking at uh, at the entire thing you want the silhouette to be your focus because when sand is flat that's what you're going to get Right, we're about there. Well done, Craig. Thank you. So we want to almost a point. So take your time. our spear point let's make it into a true spear now so we're gonna take off that chuck get rid of our waist back with the sanding disc Lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. Dust extraction is going to go on again. And now you can sand your spear tip flat. So there we are. So we've got our nice flat spear tip. Now what I've done is just added a little bit more definition by sanding the side flat, taking away the roundness as well. And when you put those reactive paints on, so basically what we've got here is black base and then um, not even a reactive paint. This is purely highlighting um, with um, a cream type material just over the, the lumps and bumps. And that especially works when you create um, those lumps and bumps. So with this shield, and we're going to bring in our soldier again, with this shield here, you can see where I've hit this. <laughs> These are supposed to be sword marks. This is my 12-inch rule. Um, I've just hit it a few times. And then painted it black and then gone over it with the, um, with the creams. 
um, uh, the gills. We're going to go over this many times in the next few weeks. This is uh, one of my favorite finishes or type of finishing. Just have a quick look at uh, our Spartan Warriors helmet here. You can see those sword marks in there as well. We're just picking out um, the high spots, just giving that impression of metal. Okay, so like I said, this isn't a how to make the soldier. This is just showing you some of the key points, some of the bits of inspiration, some of your source materials. Um, pretty much this is down to you and your imagination. So Craig, have we got any, any questions for the minute? No, we're all good. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Now, the next few weeks, like I say, we're going to start looking at some exciting new products that we're bringing in. Um, and we have a few sessions on finishing and embellishing. Um, and even some airbrushing as well. So, uh, like I said, I hope you I hope you've enjoyed that. If you can get to London, like I say, um, on the thirteenth, um, uh, 14th, 15th, and sixteenth, then I'd love to see you there. So, with Jason, I know um, it's, a, it's a wonderful event. So, please come and join us. But uh, until next week, everybody, thank you for stepping stopping by. If you like what you've seen, you know what to do: thumbs up, share as, with as many people as you can, and, and subscribe to our channel. Um, but until next time. Thanks for stepping by. See you again. Bye-bye.